So how did I find Graham? Um, I'm very keen a collector of photographs and I regularly buy pictures on eBay and uh, this photograph of Miles, Barry Miles came up for sale which I bought and on the back I had no name of who'd taken it. Uh, I was very fortunate to meet Barry Miles and showed it to him and said, have you any idea who took this picture of you? And he said, oh yes, that's, I know this picture very well. It was taken by my good friend Graham Keane. I said, is he still around? And he said, oh yes, he, he is, he's living in battle. Um, can, can I have his address? Anyway, he kind of gave me his address and I went to see him in battle and he had this amazing archive of photographs uh, that had never been exhibited before and when we heard about the V&A doing the show on the 60s it seemed a perfect moment to put everything together and we worked really hard finding the most interesting pictures to include on the show. International Times was the first um, counterculture newspaper um, came at a very important time in the 60s. I was a just left school and just started university in London. We used to buy it every fortnight, it came out fortnightly. Um, I actually met John Hoppy Hopkins, offered to be a volunteer, helped sort their, their back issues. I used to go regularly to the arts lab um, and all the things that were advertised and written about in, in um, International Times as a, a good guide to what alternative society could be about. John Hopkins was the initiator of International Times. He'd come back from America full of ideas about free press. Uh, so he got Jim Haynes, who was running the Arts Lab, and he got Miles, who was running his Indica bookshop, and the three of them set up the newspaper with a few other people, um, including Tom McGrath as the editor. Now, Tom McGrath... Uh, was the features editor at Peace News at the time, but he had a heroin habit and his editorship didn't last long. And after that, the paper seemed to go um, into a bit of disarray. None of the three directors, Hockey, Jim or Miles, really had time to oversee what was happening. So the paper started to come out late and generally it was a bit of a mess. <clears throat> now at the end of, no, at the beginning of 1968 I'd come back from Cambodia um, and I was really, I didn't want to take photographs anymore. Um, that's another story, but anyway, uh, I went down to Covent Garden to see Miles and, and Hoppy, tell him I was back, how are things going, and Miles took me out to lunch and asked me if he'd like to do, this, do the layout, because the guy they had there, um, an American, was on acid a lot of the time. And he was taking three weeks to lay out the magazine that was supposed to come out every two weeks. So they gave him a ticket to Amsterdam. And of course, uh, the, the authorities never let him back into England. So anyway, I started doing the layouts under the editorship of Bill Levy. It went well for a couple of weeks. A new editor came in. Bill Levy shot off to Amsterdam uh, to run a sex paper. And the new editor was a guy who knew his business down to the ground called Peter Stansel. He'd done journalistic training up in Yorkshire on newspapers. He'd done broadcasting in Cyprus. And he was very efficient and we got on like a house on fire. The business manager uh, was elegant, bearded, three-piece suits, one of those wonderful little attaché cases. Um, but his main object, um, his main thing in life, was that he was large-scale dope dealer. Anyway, so I started it. International Times.
and we ran it very efficiently, um, bringing it out on time every two weeks. And the advertising grew because they knew it was in good hands and we were going to come out regularly. Um, and I think we were running at about 20,000 copies a fortnight. Anyway, it was working very well. But that's how I became involved in it. And you were art editor? Well, you could call me an art editor, but I was learning on the job, really. I had really not very much experience. But I got fascinated with typefaces, with the layouts, you know, placing the pictures, that kind of thing. I, I felt I was in my element. Did they drop you in at deep end, basically? Yes, yes. Yeah. But the thing was that it didn't actually matter. Um, a bit like the um, uh, punk magazines, ten years or so later, um, people appreciated the roughness of the, of the layouts, the awkwardness, the colours put in the wrong place. I mean, most of that was accident rather than design and I tried actually to make it readable at least. At the heart of what is depicted in uh, Graham's pictures is this this wave, this move, this, this thing that was coming together which is known as the counterculture uh, and I think it's it's a series of, it's a group of people, a series of events, uh, a spirit of the, that time which, which has changed this country forever. There's some interesting characters on the walls. I mean, there are one or two people I have known, so it's a kind of trip down memory lane as well. I was a teenager at the time, and I must say the counterculture rather scared me. I was very conservative. Uh, but today I'm very curious, very curious about this aspect of British life because it's in a sense the compost out of which I grew uh, my generation uh, there we owe it to ourselves to, to take an interest and keep the story of what was happening in the 60s very much alive uh, but thinking of you know, people I've met people I've known uh, delighted to see where is he on the wall just beside me here uh, Gustav Metzger uh, who was such an influential figure at the time, but whose art, rather like Yoko Ono's art, of itself is very ephemeral. Uh, it's, it's important to keep those names. Yoko is very much in the public eye because of marrying John Lennon. Uh, but someone like Gustav Meska, who was a real uh, kind of, in the, in the kindest possible way, an anarchist in the world of art, uh, asking questions in the way the Dadaists did, uh, it, it is important that those people be remembered and their cultural contribution be remembered. There's a splendid picture down the far end I see there of Robert Fraser, uh, Groovy Bob as he came to be known. And I remember him so well from the early 70s. Uh, but wow, what, what, a, what a personality he was, not as an artist, but in bringing artists to public attention. His gallery was the happening place. And there are countless others. You know, it's a, it's a very stimulating uh, exhibition and, and a real treasure trove. been on that Moscow trip that Hoppy came along 
and when we all got back to London, um, Miles, who couldn't come on the Moscow trip, and a couple of other friends, I took them up to London to meet Hoppy. Um, but that was oh, years before. Miles was still at art school then, I think. What was the Moscow trip? That was the trip in the hearse. Yes, that's right. A number of us in Cheltenham, the, around the art school, um, two of two of our group were card-carrying communist members, uh, and they longed to go to Moscow to see what it was like. I don't think they had any real illusion that um, uh, communism was actually going to sweep the world do away with all ills. Anyway, we bought a hearse which had been painted yellow because a trad jazz group had been touring with it. Um, I think we paid 50 quid. Anyway, it was painted yellow to begin with um, and there was plenty of room in the back and, and, and so we generally organised a trip. Um, getting people who could afford it. I think we all put 50 quid into a kitty to get us there and back. Um, there were th three or four girls. We wanted 11 people to make it economic. And in the end, we were short of oh, three or four. Because um, uh, if you can imagine at the time, the Cold War was really a tangible kind of thing um, and parents didn't want their children to go, <laughs> go as, you know, across Eastern Europe to Moscow, they were frightened. So we advertised for more people to come um, in through friends in Oxford and four people replied and came with us, and one of them was Hoppy. Um, he had a girlfriend at Oxford. He'd been at Cambridge, you know, got his degree. Um, and we picked him up, I can remember, we picked him up in on the old Kent Road, and that's where I met Hoppy, because we had an interest in phot photography. He actually had a job at Winfrith Heath in Dorset, which was the Atomic Energy Authority. He's actually working for the government. I can remember doing this issue because Hoppy had come out of prison. He'd been reading Marshall McLuhan, The Medium is a Message, and he wanted to shake things up a bit. So this whole in issue is printed on on each spread, so it's very confusing to read. See this? <coughs> That's the next page, complete. Okay. So if you are trying to read it. That way, right. you only get half the message, <laughs> and you have to look back to that one, <laughs> and, and everything goes across the middle. Right. Okay. We dropped it immediately. Hoppy was out of the office.
sent Jim Haynes a letter saying more or less that he was going to <coughs> leave his wife and take up with Yoko and Mary. Right. Well. As a piece of memorabilia the original would be worth an absolute fortune. Unfortunately, to get it on the page, I cut it up into different pieces, stuck it down on a piece of cardboard, and Lord knows what happened to it after that. 